Okay, it's very exciting. We've got two wonderful keynotes uh, for this afternoon. I'm very pleased that both have accepted the invitation to come and join us, one online and one in person. The format for the session is we've got one hour, slightly less actually now, um, and what we'd like to do is uh, run one keynote after the other, and then whatever time we have left, uh, we can use for a shared responses and interaction to both keynotes. So very excited to introduce our first keynote this year, Bryant Keith Alexander. Bryant is a Dean of Leola Marymount University's College of Communication and Fine Arts, where he is also a Professor of Communication, Performance and Cultural Studies. My first exposure to Bryant's work was in 2005 the third edition of the Handbook of Qualitative Research, by which time Bryant was already very well established and very well respected as a researcher and as a practitioner, as an educator. For me and many others, that chapter on performance ethnography was groundbreaking, eye-opening for me, certainly. It helped open doors to new ways of working for many of us. Fast forward to 2022, Bryant has around 200 publications now, including seven books. The most recent is co-authored with Mary Weems and titled Collaborative Spirit Writing and Performance in Everyday Black Lives. We're delighted to have Bryant with us today. Please join me in welcoming him as our first keynote. Hello, good people. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you in this manner for the International Conference of Autoethnography. This short performative piece under the guise of a keynote uses heart beats as a literal and figurative trope and three movements to reference the precarity of living at the confluence of pandemic, racial unrest, and intervening stressors of living relative to where I reside in the United States and where you live or where you roam. Embracing the theme of the conference, I am claiming the right to roam, to think, to reimagine and create, as well as to physically migrate across borders in mind, memory and movement in shifting locations in which my imagination roams and my body locates itself and struggles to sustain itself, to beat, to bounce and to rebound from the boundaries and the troubles of the world. Yes, I am giving myself the right and taking permission as a moral obligation to trouble and to expand and engage ways of generating knowledge that is seemingly particular, but is always and already plural. And through the telling and the told, we share our joint humanity of knowing each other anew through narrative with auto ethnography as serving as a humanity making methodology of knowing self in relation to others in which we bridge and breach the borders of being the other with and for one another. This piece explores the notion of beats as a basic rhythmic unit of measure in music in activism and in cardiac situations, each as necessary components of our joint humanity to ask questions about the curative in telling of lived experience through autoethnography as cautionary tale and emancipatory rhetorics. It brings together my interest in the lyrical politics of music, my positionality in the Black Lives Matter movement by virtue of being a Black life that matters, along with narratives of health and recovery. The notion of heart is used in both literal and metaphorical ways to get at the matter of beats in socio-cultural formations that spark both action and trauma and heart as a constant and universal metaphor for what will be needed as a central component to change our current social traumas where I live and where you reside. Performance in this project is constructed as a resuscitation of the liveliness of the everyday, a methodology of re-enlivening the textual contours of everyday living with autoethnography centered as the heartbeat 
of community through shared aspects of human vulnerability, breaking the isolation and solitude of experience to further allow our spirits to roam, if not to soar. Beat number one, the payback revisited. I was walking my dog on one of the few pleasures of excursion during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I saw a familiar sight, one of the several delivery trucks dropping off the vague necessities of living or the follies of impulse buying online to one of our sequestered neighbors. As my dog Pickles and I moved closer to um, the momentarily vacated truck while the delivery was being made, a familiar song with a distinct beat was playing on blast coming from the truck. Now, I immediately recognized the song as James Brown singing the payback. I giggled and I began to sing along. Then I saw the truck driver, a much younger black man who was bobbing his head, heading, um, sort of getting his groove on as he returned to his truck. And we, we smiled at each other with a knowing recognition of each other's appreciation of the same tune. And I said to him, what do you know about the payback? And we, we both laughed. We laughed in that way that older black men always josh with younger black boys as ritual play. And if it's delivered just right, they know that you're teasing and trying to connect across generations. And he simply said, this is just good shit, man. And I'm, I'm waiting for mine. And I said, oh yeah, you're right. We waved and we moved in opposite directions, each still smiling, each bobbing our heads to the beat and still singing strained lyrics of the payback. I smiled for the rest of our walk as I thought about what the young black man said. You see, that classic funk tune, the payback, tells a loosely constructed narrative of the male singer expressing the revenge he plans to take against the man who betrayed him with his wife being implicated in the betrayal. The, the plot is to pay back. The threat is interwoven in a cyclic groove and a sort of freestyle jamming rant rife with with, with James Brown's signature screams, shouts, and grunts, with the sounds of the wah-wah guitar pedal that bends and manipulates frequencies, sometimes mimicking the human voice like a cry or a squeal and a call and response with the singer, the beat, beat, beat of soul. In some ways, in some ways, this is a heart broke song, a, a somebody done somebody wrong song, is that what the young black man was referencing? Somebody did wrong, did him wrong, and he was waiting for payback. Then I started thinking more about payback as the return of debt, or maybe the payback as reparations, a different kind of somebody done somebody wrong song, a different kind of repayment of debt. The young delivery agent is a black male living in the United States of America listening to the payback. And he said, and I'm waiting for mine. Maybe he was talking about reparations from slavery and its inherent historical effects on all African-American people leading to the everyday inequities to which we are still professing that black lives matter in the United States in the middle of a pandemic that is also ravaging communities of color. Can reparations also include the blatant neglect that stretch across time to address black trauma today, including the distrust of government vaccines relative to other historical truths of experimentation on black bodies as guinea pigs for white survival with this disease or that disorder or another surgical procedure in the United States of America and black fear of the COVID vaccine as another experiment on our black tolerance, black trauma extends through generations, through legacies of pain and suffering. What is the compensation for that form of intergenerational trauma? 
what do you seek reparations for in your personal or cultural history, in the places and spaces where you live? What price must be paid for what was lost relative to life and liberty, dignity and spirit in the middle passages of your willing or unwilling travels? What payback do you seek that would allow your spirit to roam free? As I revisited the beat and the repeats of James Brown singing the payback, each beat and repeat established the rhythmicity of a racing heart with a base of resentment and anger interrupted with a sequel of anguish and a commitment to revenge. Whether revenge for his woman or for a restored humanity, there is anger and a desire for revenge or recompense or reparations. Oh, <laughs> payback is a bitch, y'all. Be careful where you roam. Beat number two, standing at the intersection, July 16th, 2021. I traveled the distance to stand, to stand at the intersection of a beat down, 38th Street East and Chicago Avenue South in Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA, the location where George Floyd was murdered on May 25th, 2020. A beat down that ended when a police officer knelt on Floyd's neck and back for nine minutes and 29 seconds. A, a beat down punctuated by the repetition of his gasping cries of, I can't breathe in a rhythmicity of labor, suffering and dying that has become a main beat as in an impulse to the Black Lives Matter movement, which has catalyzed our national sensibilities about police violence against unarmed Black people in the United States with shock waves felt around the world. I am standing as a Black man at a memorial site at the intersection of memory and monument, each stands to the other as process and product in a circularity of remembering and a desperate act of not forgetting. I'm, I'm standing. I'm standing in this now sacred location, witnessing a monument to brutality built through psychologies of knowing ourselves in relation to an absented other and the ugliness of the continued racial struggle in everyday society in the United States of America, and maybe, maybe in the places you live or where you roam, I'm standing. I'm standing at a site of trauma in the confluence of COVID-19 with masked citizens of community and international visitors who tend, tend to the monument, raise fists of defiance, power and solidarity, images of the dead, icons of faith, resistance and hope, markers of caution, clouds of heavenly glory, directional insistence in a turnabout that points to the location of the death of the death all marking the scene of the crime, along with the litany of fading names on the streets of those who preceded him in policed to death Black tragedy in the United States of America. The monument is to George Perry Floyd Jr. But in the location as I stand, I am transfigured, not just as a mourner or a tourist, but as a Black male survivor for yet an undetermined future. My PhD does not protect me in any way from the everyday acts of violence to black bodies in these United States of America. And through seeing and being there, there, I am now further empowered and energized with the responsibility to critically tend to both memory and memorial through auto ethnography as a black man in, a, in writing with critical intent to a broader cultural context in ways that make a difference. That is the heart of the matter. And the still beating, beating, beating pulse of energy to which this monument gives life to activism. The monument that was built and maintained 
and the pilgrimage of my presence from California, along with countless others from around the world to Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA, is not the obligatory maintenance of appearances or the ritualistic paying of respect to which all communities must address their dead. It is, as Daniel Harris and Stacey Holman Jones write, it is an activist affect as a commitment, as a care, as a caution to survival to which we must all heed. Because in such a beat down, y'all, all, all of our humanity is defeated and there is no roaming when you're dead. B3, hearts beating fast or slow. August 13, 2021. During COVID, I took a fall. A fall later diagnosed as cardiac arrhythmia, a type of irregular beating of the heart. A fall that took me on my first ambulance ride as a 50 year old black man. I don't recommend it. A fall that landed me in the emergency room at an inner city hospital that would not have been my first choice. A fall that kept me in the emergency room for two days because of both an unstable heartbeat with constant poking and bleeding and monitoring and because every bed in the hospital was occupied due to COVID. A fall that had me propped up in a bed in a jointly shared emergency room ER with a mask, listening to blood curdling screams from patients in pain, in resistance, and in a dysphoria of location of this inner city hospital. I was placed in an ER multi-occupancy room with an array of shared and revolving roommates you know, the, the older lady who was being monitored as they waited for her transfer to another hospital because her insurance didn't cover where her emergency landed her in a country without equal and universal health care for all. As she emanated a bronchial rattle throughout the night, the older obese man with gout who screamed and groaned whenever he moved or someone touched his feet or legs and the, and the hot mama, the, the hot mama who walked in wearing a pink velour jumpsuit with the word juicy on the backside as she hacked and wheezed from a severe asthma attack. A fall, a fall that had me hooked up on an EKG and blood pressure for 48 hours with the beep, beep, beep of fast and slow beats of my heart that echoed as a basic rhythmic unit measuring my well-being and the automatic squeeze and release and the squeeze and release of the blood pressure cuff throughout the night. While I wore the now ubiquitous mask of COVID protection in the ER waiting room of that inner city hospital of fall, a fall that was severe enough that I was transferred to the cardiac floor to a private room and not released until a clinical cardiac electrophysiologist was called from vacation to examine me. He diagnosed that I needed a transvenous pacemaker to help with the beat, beat, beat of my heart that was running irregularly with no sign of ever returning to whatever normal was. Now there is a new, new normal for me of keeping time, uh, a metronomic insert to the heart that shocks and stimulates in the rhythms in the new syncopated COVID time related beats of our lives that will linger in me, in us, forever, differently. In the hospital, my mind returned to a previous article I wrote entitled, Bodies Yearning on the Borders of Becoming, a performative reflection on three embodied axes of social difference, celebrating the work of sociologist Laurel Richardson. I wrote then, which feels like now. I believe that like Richardson after a fall, we are all trying, 
trying to tell our stories as another attempt to feel in communion with others and to find our own rhythms of living, trying to tell our stories so that we continually strive to call each other to attend to our joint humanity as arrhythmic and asynchronous as it is, which is really everyday living continually striving as she writes to tell the stories of embodied life in times and places of shared trauma to make a difference in each other's lives. Maybe to allow permission for each of us to roam freely. Getting off life support, a conclusion. Now I'm thinking that the heart of the matter is really the matter of the heart. How do we continue to live and thrive in a world that demands so much of us, our mind, body, and spirit, and still remain fully alive for self and others? How do we learn how to spell reparations, not just as a form of payback, but as forms of respect, recognition, reconciliation, restitution, reclamation, and repatriation for all peoples that have been wronged in the making of these United States of America and all indigenous peoples of lands across the globe, the places where you live and we visit, where the vestiges of past lives, territorial struggles, and the blood of forgotten people soak the ground we live and walk, land acknowledgments, in which we must recognize, witness, and give mournful thanks for our current pleasures and privileges. How do we mark territories of terror, not just with landmarks we create to visit as monuments to memory, but in the redirection and right-sizing of human dignity and the installation of laws that prohibit the perpetuation of violence through overt action, through neglect, and the prioritizing of human need based on political ambition and party lines. What intersections do you stand at and why? How do we engage through autoethnography in a deep critical reflectivity, refractivity, and reflexivity on what we have all been through and continue to go through in these COVID times and these ratchet times and beyond to learn, to learn more about the fragility of the human body and spirit, avoiding one thing and running smack dab into other realities of living and dying, learning about the grace to which we need to extend to one another and to ourselves learning more about what resistance and persistence and survival looks like through COVID and other atrocities of everyday life as strategies of transforming self and society that require a thought-filled recognition of the tipping point, the tipping points of our humanity, of our commitments to change and a disciplined approach to making it happen against precarity. Maybe these are the questions that autoethnography ask and seek to answer. What does your heart beat too fast or too slow about? How do we avoid being witness, party, or victim to the beat, beat, beat downs of everyday living? COVID, racism, isolation, the politics of difference, of indifference, of sexism, classism, and particularity in a forced new normal or a forced always and already the same? How do we resist being patsy and pawn to the triggering effects of change and engage a new new normal? through a proactive political performative activism in which we assert a will to create new possibilities of being and becoming? And how do we begin to chart the rhythms and the beat, beat, beat of our hearts in synchrony with each other for our joint survival, for our roaming together alone? For the heart of the matter is this. We need to get off life support, meaning the artificial ties and constraints that not only keep us stabilized, but anchor us in the pains of our past so that we can begin to support each other's lives, all lives, 
that matter. I believe that autoethnography helps to excavate those pains, moving them to first possibility and then to potentiality. In autoethnography, the particular becomes plural and the private is made public and political with a purpose in the processes of information, formation, and transformation of self and society. So in the end, as we all support each other's right to roam and tell of lived experience through autoethnography, I wanna offer you this Irish blessing from this black man in the United States to you for wherever you might roam. And because my dear, dear, sweet friend, Daniel Harris mentioned earlier that they cannot sing in this moment. I wanna impromptu sing this prayer, this blessing to all of you, but particularly with Daniel in mind. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may you keep safe in the gentle, loving arms of God. Be well and claim your right to Rome. Thank you. Yay. <laughs>